Welcome to the 18th installment of ESPN Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. I'm your host, Tiff Wells. With me today is former Rainbow Warrior football running back, Nate Ilawa. Nate, welcome to Talk Story. Glad to be here, Tiff. Thanks for having me. No problem, Nate. Thanks for joining us. Now, as we look at your bio from, from years past, it says you were born in Oakland. What do you remember about growing up in the Bay? Um, not much. Uh, I think, I think we left when I was probably two. We moved to Hawaii uh, for the first time. Um, um, I do know one thing. Um, we used to be uh, babysat by Ty Christensen, who's an old uh, Oakland Raider. Uh, so I'm definitely a Raiders fan. But I do remember that much. Um, but that's about it. Uh, that's where my Raiders has come, come in as far as being a fan. How sad were you when they moved from Oakland uh, to Vegas? Um, yeah, just a tad. I mean, but like I said, I'm a military kid, so uh, I wasn't in Oakland too long. So, um, and Vegas is kind of an upgrade, I think, um, for them. A lot, a lot better stadium. Um, but yeah, but for the people in Oakland, I'm sure that was tough, you know, a few that have ties there. So, um, yeah, for me, not so much. Vegas is kind of an upgrade. For you growing up, everybody knows you were into football, but what other sports did you play growing up? Um, kind of everything. You know, I got four four other brothers, um, so we played about anything we could play. Um, we'll fight and get our hands on baseball, on a lot of basketball, and basketball hoops, of course, at everybody's house. Um, and then, you know, just all your friends. So you kind of played everything. I mean, when I used to live in Oklahoma, I, I wrestled for the first time when we got there. That's huge over in the Midwest. Um, but yeah, you know, basketball, football were kind of the main things. You know, a lot of friends that were into the same stuff. So definitely stayed active growing up. You mentioned the military and being a being a military uh, from a military family. Family, uh, California, Oklahoma, Hawaii, like you said, of course, Virginia. What other states uh, did you spend time in? Uh, I spent a little time in Utah. Um, also, a couple years in Missouri. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri area. So um, definitely got across the country, you, you could say. Um, and definitely experienced, you know, had a lot of different friends kind of growing up. Um, definitely experienced a lot of different areas and foods and things like that that the country has. Who or what got you into playing football? Um, it was probably just my brothers, you know. Um, it was something that, you know, the older brothers kind of liked. We all kind of liked, you know, we watch football games. Um, so as soon as the game's over, you know, definitely a tackle session goes off in the in the living room, um, jumping over couches and, and stuff like that. Um, but probably just definitely my brothers, you know, something that we all enjoyed and in our family um, definitely enjoyed um, growing up. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it has to be my brothers. You know, they're, I guess, my first opponents and, Definitely a big support cast as well. We've heard about tackling dummies and other sorts of that, other sorts of that kind of football equipment. Was it harder to jump over a couch or harder to jump over a would-be tackler on the field? Um, probably the couch. <laughs> Only because if you mess up the couch, you know, your mom was going to probably whoop you and stuff and things like that. So the so you make, I mean, you just wanted to make sure you cleared the couch. Football is all right. You can catch the guy in the next play, but you mess up the couch and yeah, you're going to be in big time trouble. <laughs> we don't want, we don't want mom to get mad now. Uh, when, when nope. did you know football was going to be the sport you were going to focus on? Um, probably like in the first couple of years of high school. Um, like my brothers, they're all pretty tall, a lot taller. They're about six foot six one. And I, I stopped growing. And I was in Northern Virginia, so basketball is pretty big up there. So I was actually better in basketball um, at that time. Um, but I didn't grow anymore. So all the point guards across the state are about 6'2", 6'1", 6'2". And I wasn't growing anything. So I just figured, you know, let's just focus on this football stuff and, and get going. I was okay at football too. But, you know, you know, when everybody in the area is point guards are 6'1", 6'2", 6'3", you know, it's – Makes it kind of tough trying to be out there running around at five eight five nine. Well, you, like you said, you mentioned the height listed at five eight five nine, but when you used to play for UH, you had the fro, so that fro made you about six feet six one, right? 
Yeah, but the fr the fro can't block a jump shot. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. Um, you could probably get by with the fro and everything like that, but um, yeah, it didn't help much in basketball though. It's just good for looks, but can't really can't really dunk the ball with the afro. So <laughs> no, no, you no, you cannot. Now, now for football, Nate, were you always a running back? <laughs> um, initially, you know, my early stages in Pop Warner and uh, elementary and middle school kind of. I uh, was playing running back a lot. It wasn't until I got to high school. I uh, had my high school coach, Chris Beatty, um, asked me if I wanted to play slot. I was actually slotted to play uh, free safety uh, uh, my junior year, but um, he asked me if I wanted to play slot back. And I was like, man, no way. But he said, no, it's just like running back, just a longer handoff. Um, I was like, all right. So we tried it, and uh, I found some success, you know, my junior year. I uh, ended up breaking the state record for receiving yards, so. Um, I kind of stuck there. We ran run and shoot in high school. So that was a big draw to come into Hawaii um, on top of my family being out here. Um, but it wasn't, but I had played running back, you know, earlier in, in my years. But then, you know, at UH, um, uh, had some injuries and things like that. And Devon Bess, Ryan Gretz, Mullen were on, were on roster. And I, I made that transition to running back. <laughs> You, you mentioned being a part of the military family and the fact that you moved around a lot. Did that help? Uh, did that help you moving forward when you ended up picking Hawaii and being out here on your own? Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think it was the military because uh, you know, just a little background. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, my dad, um, his final station, his final post was, was out here at Kariwa. So um, I stayed in Virginia my senior year. Uh, on my own, um, just to finish up high school, um, my senior year, and then my parents are already out here. Um, so it was the military that kind of brought my dad out here, and then I guess the military kind of brought me out here as my family was already here. Um, but yeah, preparing uh, to kind of, you know, just pick up, you know, um, and move places and like gaining friends and getting used to a new spot, you know, that definitely came from, you know, military upbringing. Uh, being able to make friends fast. Uh, but the toughest part was kind of leaving, you know, old friends behind. But thank goodness for social media nowadays, we can kind of catch up with all those people. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, military upbringing, you know, kind of helped me um, be able to meet uh, new people quick. Uh, but I think it also helped when I was at UH because we'd have a lot of kids come from the mainland. Um, you know, I could help them make, make them feel comfortable uh, for being away because I knew what it was like to constantly be the new guy, you know, in a new place and, you know, not know anybody. Growing up, what athletes did you try to model your football game after? Um, so mine was definitely, you know, Barry Sanders, you know, when it came to football. Um, that's who you wanted to be. Everybody wanted to juke everybody at the park as kids. Um, he was definitely that guy um, who would juke you know, whole team by himself, and plus he played for the Lions, so he had to drink everybody by himself. No, but um, him, you know, and, you know, as far as even, like, basketball, you know, this is the, you know, Jordan's heyday kind of times Um, growing up. He was huge. I'm a Lakers fan and everything, but uh, with Jordan, you know, and coming at then during my high school time, Allen Iverson was huge. Um, You know, it, was, it wasn't just the fact that, you know, how talented they were athletically, but they were just different, you know, Iverson with his cornrows and, you know, and Urban Ware and uh, Deion Sanders was huge too. So, I mean, just you know, a lot of guys who had big time personas and, you know, on and off the field. So it didn't matter how they looked um, off the field. They always showed up from game time. We're recording this on a Tuesday, which of course is January 26th. And for many sports fans, this uh, commemorates one year of uh, that tragic helicopter accident with uh, Kobe Bryant and his and his daughter, uh, Gianna. You mentioned you're a Lakers fan. What is, do you have a favorite Kobe Bryant memory or do you have a couple of favorite memories that stand out? Um, yeah, there's a couple, you know, and you know, our UH days, my UH days early on were during that little run, that little heyday of with Kobe and Shaq. Um, you know, I think a couple would be, you know, they used to train over there at the, uh, at the stand sheriff in the weight room and things like that. And, and we were fortunate enough to be allowed access to lift while they would lift. Um, so just to see them live and um, to have their um, exhibition games here at the Stan Sheriff, you know, it was always cool because, you know, they were winning titles during those times. So 
Um, to see them in the weight room, um, I think one time we got we had the spot for Shaq uh, while he was benching. Um, but so that was pretty cool, I mean, to see them. And he would just bench and then be on the Stairmaster. I guess his toe was still acting up. But um, that was always cool. But then uh, probably for Kobe, it was um, when he dunked on Yao Ming, um, which, which was pretty dope because, you know, the hype with Yao Ming coming into the league. Um, and then we had been watching it as, you know, all the teammates at UH, we had a lot of Laker fans, of course. Um, we were watching that, and we all got to watch it live with, you know, like Jeremiah Cochran, um, Josh Galei, some Mike Brewster, Omega Hogan. Um, so there's a lot of Houston boys on the team, and we were Laker fans. So these guys are rooting for the Rockets, of course, and Kobe Duncan on Yao Ming was huge. Uh, one of those jump out your seat kind of moments. So, um, yeah, it's been one year, and, uh, you know, a lot of great memories, you know, of Kobe um, doing great things on um, on the court. but you know, even more tragic was a lot of stuff he was doing off the court, you know, post career, um, you know, we, we, that was coming to fruition, I guess, and coming about. And, you know, it's, it's tough to think that, you know, all the stuff he was going to be doing um, is not going to be able to happen now. But, um, you know, that in, in that sense, his legacy is carried on through, you know, others. And, you know, hopefully people could continue to um, do great things both on and off the court, which is cool. Coming up in a couple of weeks, uh, National Letter of Intent Day, where high school seniors, of course, sign their letters of intent to go play collegiate ball. Take us back to your NLI day, and what do you remember about it? Um, yeah, mine was pretty interesting. So um, I didn't tell too many people I was going to sign with the University of Hawaii. Um, I had been slotted to go uh, you know, to Virginia Tech and – um, I had verbal there, you know, just the home school at the time. Um, and, you know, when I put on the UH hat, uh, a lot of people were like, who is that? Because um, they just got the new logo. So, you know, I don't know. I think only my head coach at the time knew and my parents knew, obviously. But um, in Virginia, I was able to sign with Hawaii. Um, so I had a lot of questions, you know. A lot of people for Virginia Tech, I think. Um, but I got paid off and stuff like that. I'm like, no, UH ain't got no money. But, uh no, uh, um, I had a lot of high school teachers that were Virginia Tech alum, and they would always constantly just, you know, drop by my classroom or just say something about, you know, Hokie. Even my principal was a Virginia Tech alum, so um, switching up and going to Hawaii right, right at the last second was kind of a stunner, but um, I knew where I wanted to go. Um, I mean, I'm glad I did uh, make that move to, to come to Hawaii to play ball because um, – uh, I had a lot of great memories, obviously. You know, I had a lot of great teammates, coaches, uh, great fans, obviously. Um, you know, and it worked out for everyone. You know, I had a great time. I did well. Um, you know, we had some good teams and things like that. And so it worked out well. Nate, we need to take a break. So stay right there. Along with yeah. former UH football running I'm back, Nate Alawa, I'm Tiff Wells. You're listening to ESPN Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. Welcome back to episode 18 of ESPN, the Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. I'm your host, Tiff Wells. We're here with former Hawaii football running back, Nate Alawa. Now, Nate, you redshirted your first year here at UH. How tough was that? You know, I look, I know, I look back, yeah, it was, it was actually pretty tough at the time. Um, you know, I'm coming out, you know, like I said, in high school, we ran the run and shoot. So, you know, I felt like I had a good idea of the offense and that I could get out there and compete. Um, and when Coach Jones asked me or told me, you know, that I was going to have to red shirt, I was like, what? You know, I wanted to play. You know, I was you know, thinking I was some hot shot kid coming out of high school. Oh, man, I should be playing this and that. You know, you know now I look back and, you know, and it made sense. You know, because Coach Jones mentioned, um, you know, just sit back and learn, um, you know, about everything. And I was like, man, I got no offense, you know, in my head. I'm thinking I'm some hot shot. Um, but I got to sit back that year and watch, you know, uh, Craig Stutzman. You know, I got to watch um, Shannon Harris, um, some slot backs at the time that had the whole total package of how to, you know, get things done on and off the field, you know, how to prepare um, physically. And then Chad Owens was young, you know, being able to kind of watch him and, you know, his up, up and coming uh, 
career, um, just how to do things from, from the whole, um, from the beginning to the end. Um, I was fortunate to Richard that you had to see these guys and how they did it. Um, and it's some stuff that I still carry on today, you know, when I, when I coach kids and things like that, uh, you know, just how to prepare for the whole process. It's not just learning your playbooks and then just getting out there. It's just how to prepare your body, um, how to, you know, do certain things, how to, how to practice. You know, I just figured you go to practice, you go to practice. But, you know, Craig and those, some of those guys, some of those veterans, Timmy and all those, uh, Rolo and all those guys my first year, um, kind of showed, you know, how, how to get things done, you know, from start to finish. So, I mean, although I didn't want a red shirt, you know, I wanted to get out there, run around and, you know, and do all these kind of things, you know, I am grateful for that red shirt year to sit back and kind of learn. If there was a young athlete that wanted to learn how to better memorize plays or better remember everything in the playbook, what would be a key tip or two that you would give them that helped you remember all the plays in your playbooks? Well, if you're young, um, you know, I, I'd encourage them to find a mentor, you know, somebody that's on the team, uh, one of the older guys. Just stick to them like glue um, and ask all kind of questions because now – you know, I look back, you know, I always thought I was bothering uh, some of the older guys, you know, when I'd have to ask them something. But I think it kind of helps them, too. It kind of helps them make sure they know what they're doing because they turn into a sort of a player coach. Um, so it kind of works both ways. You know, you get the information you need, but I think it kind of reiterates things for the veteran. Um, so I, I'd encourage, you know, youngins to to, to, to kind of latch on to some of those veterans, you know, because they can kind of teach you how to do some things too as well um, as far as studying habits. Um, they can give you tips on how they memorize um, things like that, you know, and there might be things that are similar in a playbook, you know, then, and, and they can kind of help you just kind of put things, you know, into different sort of classes. Like, Hey, this is just kind of like this, this is like that play. So this should trigger you to do this, you know, the techniques that we worked on and things like that. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I think, not being afraid. Don't be afraid to, to ask the veterans, you know, and I was fortunate to have some, some veterans that were willing to help me, you know, as much as possible. You know, there's those stories of those veterans that <laughs> they might not want to help you and things like that. But then, you know, I always look and think that those teams probably aren't that great because if they're really protecting their job, um, then they would get out there and work a lot harder, not just, you know, cut off information to the younger guys because they're afraid to lose their position. No, I think it makes everybody better. It makes the veteran have to work if he knows this, this youngin's coming up, trying to get some playing time or trying to get on the field, the veteran has to step their game up. So I think overall it makes the team better. Um, so, I mean, yeah, just hop in there, um, find some veterans. Um, and they're more, usually, I want to say they're all most likely going to be trying to help you because uh, they've been in that situation before um, where they're trying to learn. And, you know, they're going to just – make the team better. I mean, that's kind of their gift to the team to make sure it's in good hands when they leave. You brought up your head coach here at UH, uh, June Jones, who of course did the run and shoot. And he was quoted as saying, my perfect game or my ideal game is we never run the ball once. Did you laugh when you heard that quote? <laughs> yeah. Um, because it's true. <laughs> I mean, he, I think if he could, he would. Um, but, I mean, I, I laugh too because I'm fortunate because we ran a lot of screens. So I was probably going to get like 11 screens. So those kind of passes. So um, those shovel passes are, are fine with me as long as I can get the ball too. So, um, but, you know, but the thing is, the best thing about, you know, everybody thinks it's kind of a, you know, arrogant kind of way of how he coaches. But he also prepares, though. He prepares the kids to be able to, we could throw the ball, you know, as much as if we wanted to. But he, he takes the proper steps for, he would, he would take the proper steps for us to, to be able to do so. So it wasn't one of those just things that we're just going to throw because we can't run. It's just not only we kind of work our craft as far as throwing the ball and we, we can be able to. Um, and I wouldn't mind. I mean, like I said, I was a slot receiver first. So it's kind of like, all right, cool. That's cool for me. But, you know, you think at running back, oh, he's not going to run the ball. But like I said, he runs a lot of screens. So you're going to have your opportunity. You mentioned the fact that you not only were a running back in high school, but also were a slot and a, and a wide out. Did, that, did those overall skills help you to perfect the art of catching the shovel pass? Because every time you guys ran it, you, you ran that play to, 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 to succession very, very well every single time. Um, yeah. I mean, I think 
um, I tell people all the time, I mean, the relationship Colt and I had um, on and off the field, like we were, we play basketball together. We do all kind of stuff together. I mean, it was just a, you know, a lot of trust um, that you kind of, kind of got to have. And then, as well as with my old lineman, you know, Samson, Hercules, you know, John Estes, you know, Daniel Peressa, Tala, Sarah. Um, same thing with those guys. I hung out with those guys all the time too. So I had an understanding of how they could block things. We had an understanding of how it worked, how three man front, you know, we'd be able to get a double team on the nose. So I could kind of have an idea. So having trust in my old lineman, my quarterback, um, helped, you know, tremendously. I mean, I knowing they can hold this block here or this guy's going to go here and they'll kick them out the other way. I know I'd have to catch the ball early. I can catch and go out the back door. I can catch and go straight. Um, that's a time um, as far as building a relationship with my teammates. But Coach Jones, we did a real good job of repping it um, and having a good idea. Um, so I think it's just an overall um, team effort. You know, I mean, not to mention, I didn't even mention my wide receivers who are constantly stretching the field back in those days. So DB, they're sort of taking guys out of the box. Um, and then my old linemen are able to handle four or five guys easily. Um, so, I mean, it's just a whole team effort, you know, and I think that's one of those things where, um, you know, we took whatever coach was, 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 was calling, we were able to wrap it in practice um, and then put it to good use on the football field when it came game time. The stadium where you played at for what seemed like an eternity, you spent six years with the program. You played at Aloha Stadium. Uh, news recently coming out, of course, that uh, this facility has been condemned for future use, so no more Hawaii football games at that stadium. If you could pick maybe a favorite moment, a favorite moment or two, maybe a favorite game that you played in, what would it be and why? Um... Oh, that's a really good question. You know, I mean, I had a, I've had a lot of great memories there. Um, fortunately enough to have a lot. Um, but you know, but probably my greatest was probably when I wasn't even playing. <laughs> it was during my red shirt year. Uh, um, I, I gotta say, like the Fresno game and the the BYU game. You know, my freshman year. Um, and like I said, those that was my year of red shirting. That's my year of learning um, from the veterans. You know, and those two games, you know, it kind of uh, impressed on me the fact that, you know, when you get it right, you know, when you do the things right on and off the field, you can have that kind of um, kind of game, you know, where the place is rocking, you know, the fans are going crazy. Um, and, yeah, those two games, you know, they were pretty – they kind of still stand out to me. You know, the place was jumping. You know, that's the first time at Fresno when I – versus Fresno uh, with, with David Carr and the lady catches the game winner. Um the place was like actually shaking, you know, I had heard about it, but to actually see it, you know, and, you know, it was just an amazing feeling. Um, then of course, BYU, you know, Chad Owens is coming out party. Um, that game was amazing, you know, on top of the fact that Rolo throws eight touchdowns and things like that. Um, and then the defense is just, man, but the place was rocking. So that kind of set the tone for me um, for the rest of my career, of, um, how things could be, and how if you get your team uh, and your team gets things going, you know, that's how it should be at the stadium. So, I mean, yeah, I wasn't playing in those games, but I think those things kind of stood out. Um, and that's probably the loudest I've I've heard the stadium too. So um, those are some of the more amazing moments where definitely going to miss. Um, you know, you just kind of think back of how many players have come through Aloha Stadium um, professionally with the Pro Bowls, the Hula Bowls, um, the concerts, you know, all those kind of things, all my great teammates and all the great UH teams that have come through and who, whoever come to play against UH, you know. I swear Tom Brady came, right? Tom Brady came that one time, I would believe. Um, mm -hmm. So you can just imagine, you know, like how, many, how many players have come through those locker rooms. And I used to always think about that too when I used to sit in there and Coach Jones would always say those kind of things of, you know, how many guys have kind of come before you that have, you know, graced these locker rooms, especially for Pro Bowls you know, how many amazing players have come through. So um, on top of those memories, you know, all those kind of things. And, you know, it's, you know, when the news came out, it was kind of one of those things you're kind of like, man, you know, all the, all the fun times that we've had in there, um, not just players, but even fans who've been able to enjoy um, awesome games and exciting things. And not even, I mean, high school, I haven't even got into the high school aspect. How many high school games have been in there? Uh, how many people on the island that have played, um, at the stadium, you know, which is, it's going to be a tough thing for the see a goal, but 
Um, it's good to reflect back though. Having graduated, uh, you spent a year with the Eagles. You actually spent a couple months with the Eagles. You spent a year playing in the Arena Football League. Uh, what else have you been doing uh, since you've graduated and moved on from pro football? Um, kind of raising a little army. I've got a family of mine. Um, I've got my six kids going right now. Um, yeah, but we've just been kind of coaching. We're still kind of staying close to football. Um, I've coached, you know, on a high school level. Um, you know, it's something I enjoy doing. Closest thing to kind of playing. Um, of course, we've done all different kind of jobs here and there. Um, we used to do a radio show until Cliff left us to be the voice of volleyball. And then it all went downhill from there for me. I'm like, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, um, kind of did a little bit of everything. Um, been in the medical field a little bit. I was in freight forwarding and just doing all kinds of things. And like most people on the island, you know, just, just getting out there, making it happen. Um, but been still staying close to football, um, whether it's coaching or training kids or broadcasting, you know, I've done the last couple of years, um, you know, just kind of just be doing whatever I had to do. You mentioned, you mentioned the broadcasting and, uh, many people will see you on spectrum sports as part of the pregame and postgame crew. When you work with guys, uh, like a Rob DeMello, a Leonard Peters, Kavika Hallams, RJ Hollis. How much fun do you have? A lot, actually. You know, I mean, I wish we'd had like a behind the scenes kind of um, thing where you can catch us, you know, when the real debates and discussions kind of go on. Because um, you know, I think all of us are real passionate, you know, about the sport, you know, and especially about, you know, Hawaii football. Um, and it, it's just fun. You know, the stuff on the air is fun for us, but, you know, just being around them and everybody having their own opinion, we just, you know, bouncing ideas on this and that, debating things. Um, it's it's pretty awesome. Um, and it's fun. You know, it keeps me close to the uh, the program. Um, it keeps me close to you know, some of these players that are out there um, doing something that I was doing, you know, trying to represent, the, you know, the University of Hawaii and the state. Um, so it's an, it's, an awesome, it's an awesome thing to do. Um, you know, and it, it's pretty easy, you know, with those guys, um, especially Rob. DeMello makes, you know, things a lot easier. He's, he's, he's just out there being the guru of the whole thing. Um, but, you know, Kavika and RJ, um, you know, just awesome guys, you know, who, who are passionate about it, um, have a lot of insight, um, definitely have opinions about things, and, and it's cool to have, and as well as Rich and, and, and Rob up, upstairs. You know, those guys are doing their thing as well. But, you know, overall, it's just fun. It's just a fun opportunity. For you, was it tough to follow and cover a team uh, during this 2020 season when there was basically no media access? How hard was it to cover this team? Um, it was. I mean, initially. But, you know, what it was, what was even more awesome was the surprises we got throughout the year. You know, to see some of these guys, like, you know, uh, Turner and those guys get going. You just kind of seen this guy develop right before your eyes. You know, each week you're just hoping he somehow how are they gonna get on the ball? How are they gonna get on the ball? And he'd find a way to just get to the end zone, no matter what it was, whether it was a pass, a handoff, or he's throwing, or he's doing all kind of stuff, doing whatever he had to do, you know, to fit in and make the you know team move forward. And it, it was amazing to watch um, to see you know Chevin get in there um, and just operate. You know, this this season, um, defensively, you know, you get Darius Moussa out there just, you know, anchoring down for that defense. Um, so although we couldn't have access, you know, to get into the practices and things like that, it was it was a pleasant surprise to watch these guys develop live, you know, as far as, you know, in real time where these guys are just like, oh, man, you're seeing them. You're just anxious the next week to see this guy um, come out and continue, you know, to do, you know, what he's been doing. Um, and these guys fought, you know, I mean, you could say they have, there was a lot of slow starts, you know, you could say, um, to some of the games, but they finished strong, you know, you were just kind of hoping they could start fast, but they would always come out and just fight all the way to the end, you know, and that's commendable for sure. Um, and I'm excited to see what they do this coming year, you know, and, and, you know, what they have in store, you know, with coach Graham, you know, what they're trying to do, you know, what a tough, you know, first year as a coach, you know, you can't really get going until like the summer, you miss, don't get a spring, you you're still trying to fill out, you know, who your guys are, you know, and things like that. And, you know, I thought they did awesome, you know, given the circumstances, um, having to do um, whatever they had to, 
uh, with learning who these new guys he has on his team. And, and as far as even the new guys coming in, trying to just find ways to gel as fast as possible. So, I mean, it was awesome, you know, overall to watch. A couple more here, Nate. Uh, Super Bowl 55 coming up in about a week and a half. I know your Raiders, uh, well, they didn't make the playoffs, so I apologize for that. But who is your pick in Super Bowl 55? Do you have a final score? And who's your offensive MVP? Well, it's, it's going to be Tom Brady. Um, I'm going with Tom on this one. As you know, because you're a fellow AFC Wester, so we can't, I don't know about you, but I'm not going for the Chiefs. I mean, I just can't. I respect them. You know, I got a lot of family that lives in Kansas City, like I mentioned, and, you know, I'm happy that they're happy, but I don't know. I just can't have them win two in a row. I mean, I don't think I could live that down. But, I mean, it's going to be a good game, but I think Tom – can't. I mean, I just don't go against Tom. I mean, Tom just – Continues to amaze everybody, and he's just he's just out there getting it done. Um, final score, geez, I go. I got the Bucks. I got the Bucks 24, 17. 24-17 Bucks. Yeah, sorry, Mahomes. Um, <laughs> a little a, a little low scoring is, there. <laughs> yeah, well, I, mean, I just think I don't know how because I thought they did well the first time. The first game was twenty seven. 27-24, um, Chiefs got. But uh, now I was with them letting, you know, Cheetah go off for like 200-something yards in the first quarter. So if they just can kind of – don't go one-on-one. -on -one, don't let Davis go running around with Cheetah. Um, Double-team him. Double-team Kelsey. Don't let him get a free release. I think the Bucks will hang on to this one this time. But it's going to be exciting. You know, I mean, get, I mean, as much as I don't like the Chiefs, um, you know, because I'm a Raiders fan, I do respect their offense. They – they find creative ways to move the ball. I mean, Kelsey and, and Hill are just at the top of their games right now. And, you know, Mahomes is Mahomes. You know, he's finding, like, every angle to throw a ball. Um, so it's exciting to watch that chess match between, you know, them trying to get – trying to the Bucks trying to slow them down. Um, and then, you know, Tom Brady on the other side. You know, is how's Honey Badger and them boys going to do versus Tom Brady? So it's going to be an exciting game, you know, I think. And, you know. I thought the Raiders were going to just be allowed to go because it's Super Bowl LV. So I thought it was going to be for Las Vegas Raiders, but boy, was that wrong. But, um, and yeah, I know you're a Chargers fan, correct? Right. I, I was, I was, I was a Charger you, fan until changed? they moved to LA. I am, I am, oh. I'm a free agent. So, you know, just skip LA and go right to Las Vegas. <laughs> just come right on over. <laughs> just come right on over, you know, so. Well, since you're a free agent, you know, good luck with that. You know, just don't be a Chiefs fan, please. Don't don't no. skip LA and go to Kansas City. All right. Just I I, I, I couldn't I couldn't do that. To, I couldn't do that to stay in the AFC West. Uh, quickly, two more here, Nate. If uh, if a young athlete uh, had their season canceled uh, due to COVID, if they if they came to you for one piece of advice to stay motivated, what would your one piece of advice uh, motivation be to them? So, I mean, I tell a lot of kids now is, uh, you know, be ready, don't get ready. You know, and I, what I mean by that is, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty. And I'd like to tell kids, like, hey, you know, this date is when, you know, things going to get back to normal. But nobody knows, you know. But but we do know, you know, as far as what we can control, um, you know, is how we are. You know, the last thing you want to do is then spring a season on you real quick and you're not physically ready, you know. And I, I'd hate for you to – be a kid who is a 21 uh, class and you're just not working out. Ah, oh, man, I didn't have a season, yada, yada, yada. And a school calls you and they need you to come up in a week or two, you know, or any kind of circumstance where you don't want to not be ready, you know. And so what I tell kids is, you know, just take all that energy. And it's tough. You know, I could only imagine, you know, having your senior year shot down or junior year shot, shot down um, and you're left with kind of nothing. You know, some guys were banking on this, high school season, you know, to, to make moves or they had a good junior year and maybe the colleges were waiting um, for that senior year. So, you know, it, it, it's tough for sure. But I, I, I try to tell kids, you know, just transfer that energy into your craft and get yourself better. Um, because, you know, I'd rather have you ready this whole time um, and not get a call than to get a call and, you know, you're not ready to go, you know, and you show up to a spot and the coaches are like, dude, what happened to this guy? And you hadn't worked out that whole time. Um, it's tough, yes, but what you can't control is, um, you know, what, what, what comes of it as far as you personally. And if all, if nothing happens of it, you'll be in tip top shape, you know, so that's a good thing to have.
<laughs> There's a new training program here out, out here, Nate. This is the last one for you. You're wearing the shirt for those that can see on Facebook Live. For those that are on the oh, radio, yeah. uh, what's the shirt? And uh, if people are interested in joining, how can they do so? Yeah, so it's uh, Kaika Athletics. Um, Mike Lafaele uh, approached me probably about six, seven months ago um, about doing this. Um, and it's a uh, uh, training facility that we, we have. We just opened... Um, you know, this year, like early January, um, you know, in partnership with Alan, uh, our boy Alan, that's over at Kaika Fitness Factory. Um, so that's like the weight room portion. Um, we have like a facility where it's field, um, we have bags and we, I mean, um, it's basically an environment that we try to create, you know, for these young athletes, which is geared, you know, sort of towards football at this time, but I think we'll grow, you know, eventually into training, you know, other sports and things like that. Um, but like I said, you know, we're trying to provide um, an environment that uh, allows kids at any level of football right now um, to grow and be ready for that next level. So whether you're intermediate, going into your first year of varsity football, whenever that may be, we want to be able to kind of prepare you, you know, whether it's verbiage, drills, having an understanding of making that transfer to high school, you know, just a lot easier for you. And it's not, not anything to where you're um, – sitting back and you have no idea what the coach is talking about and you slide behind in the line. You don't want to take the rep because you're afraid to mess up in front of your peers. Uh, so we want to kind of just take that um, and help these kids bridge that gap if they're not sure of certain things. So whether it's drills, verbiage that coaches use, we, we want to kind of move them up. And if you're a high school kid trying to get off into college, we have those kind of workouts for you as well, whether it's training or even lifting. We try to prep you for that. And, of course, and then we've got some college guys that have come home um, from all over, Notre Dame boys, um, you know, USC guys, um, Stanford, Virginia. Um, they've come from uh, Hawaii, some Hawaii guys, some San Diego State guys. Um, they're coming home, and what we, we've been trying to provide for them is, is a place where they can kind of, um, I guess, stay their pace, and, you know, stay on course, you know, from wherever college they're at. Because we know what it's like, you know, you get into that break mode two weeks, you come home, you know, mom and dad just shop you around all the family, you're eating good, you're going zippies, you're hanging out with the girlfriend or whatever it may be. Um, you know, we're here to push them like it's college, you know, because we've, we've got that experience and we want to, you know, just kind of keep them, you know, in line from what they're used to. So they don't go back to their colleges. And they die on the first week of mat drills over there with everybody. Um, so, and we've had that, those guys come home, um, and they appreciate that. They're like, oh man, this is exactly what we need. So we try to catch, you know, all levels, you know, football from the youngest kind of kids, you know, where we have a young group that we have, really, really young group, eight, eight, 10 year olds, um, all the way up to the college kind of kids. Um, so we kind of cover everything. We just want to provide that environment for kids to come and, and get better. Um, and you're more than welcome. Yeah, right now, we're, we're kind of setting up the website and things like that. But um, if you've seen us on Instagram or anything like that, Ekai Athletics, you can contact Mike and I on there. You can contact me directly. Uh, my tag is just Nady Lawa um, on Instagram. And we can get you set up. Uh, we can get your kids in there, um, get them rolling. We're five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday, usually from 2 o'clock. Yeah, that's from 2 o'clock um, all the way to 5. Um, and it's, it's something that we've always been dreaming of to sort of say, but um, we're glad it's kind of coming, you know, coming, you know, around to how we like it. Um, and so far, the kids that have come through, they understand, you know, what we're about. Um, the parents, you know, kind of enjoy what we're doing. And, and we have a passion for this kind of thing, kind of helping um, the, the younger athletes um, prepare themselves for whatever it may be, you know, football-wise, but even for things that are off the field, you know, just making them better um, human beings, you know, better um, – not just athletes, but better uh, in society, you know, because you know, um, that's one of our things is, you know, we the world's always going to have football players, good football players, but we need some good people in the world too. So we kind of double dip with, you know, with this program. We kind of just kind of give life lessons to these kids um, that help you both in football and off the field. Nate, this has been a lot of fun. We really appreciate the time you've given us today. Thanks again for joining us. Oh, no problem, Tiff. It's always fun getting along with you, man. The voice. <laughs> for Nate Alao, as well as the rest of us here at ESPN Honolulu, I'm Tiff Wall saying thank you again for joining us here on the 18th edition of ESPN Honolulu Fan Friday Talk Story. Until next time, wear that mask, stay safe, and be socially distant.